Hi, I'm Lisa K. Donner, along with Jeff Charles, Sarah Calgill, Tim Donner, and Andrew Moran. And this is the Conservative Five, Liberty Nation's online TV news program. On today's episode, the Swamp Super Bowl, we take a closer look at what runs the swamp and who is really in charge. The GOP takes a licking, but is it still ticking? It's mutiny on the bounty for the Republican Party. Who will right the ship? Mad Max, super spreader of wealth being related to Maxine Waters is a lucrative position. This one's a doozy, folks. Fossil fuels go the way of the dinosaur. If Joe Biden had his way, fossil fuels may be as extinct as the dinosaurs. We'll discuss the reality of what's at stake. The Super Bowl of leftist antics, the biggest of the year, isn't in Tampa Bay. Folks, it's being played right in the swamp. And finally, exclusively for our member zone subscribers, the toughest job in the world. Hmm, the answer may just surprise you. All this and more coming up on this edition of The Conservative Five. It appears Republicans are in full mutiny mode as anti-Trumpers and pro-Trumpers are both rapidly shedding party affiliations. Several George W. loyalists believe the massive Trump base, they call it a cult, leaves no room for their brand of conservatism. Pro-Trumpers feel they have been betrayed by the Republican elites and are ready for a Trumpian party. And to validate the sinking of the ship, both Rasmussen and Reuters have released poll results that show a colossal hole in the boat. Sarah, you wrote a piece this week on these surveys and what it looks like for the party itself. Is this something that it could eliminate the GOP altogether or just a brief snow squall that will blow over before the 2020 midterms? <laughs> I, I don't see anything blowing over by 2022, that's for sure. Um, I've never seen a fractured party uh, as much as the Republicans are fractured right now. They basically turned their backs on a president um, that was duly elected by a whole bunch of people in 2016, and, the, and they just fought him on everything. So now we're at a point where, you know, he was running for re-election. Re People were out in droves, parades, boat parades, car parades, miles long. And of course, Biden is now in office. You've got a lot of honked off people in red states and they, they're bailing out of the Republican party. And then you got the, the other Republicans that think that the Trump people have taken over the Republican party and they don't wanna be part of it either. So I mean, with either one of those, if either one of those sides bails out altogether, which I think they are, I don't think there's going to be a GOP. I think it's going to just go away. I think there will be um, the MAGA party. I think there will be some sort of absorption of the never Trumpers into other places, maybe just independence. I don't think they'll start another conservative party. I think they'll just flounder around until, you know, they can figure out either to take power or, or or to just go away, because mega people aren't going away, not anytime soon. Really, honestly, the future of the Republican Party right now rests in the hands of Donald Trump and what he wants to do, because of the 75 million people that voted for him, a good chunk of that, maybe a majority, voted because of him, not because of the Republican Party, although many of them may have voted Republican anyway, given the choice. But if Donald Trump sends out the signals that he's going to start a third party, it is all over for the GOP, like like Sarah said. Uh, but I would if I had to guess and who the heck can can invade the mind of Donald Trump other than the man himself. But if I had to guess, I'd say that he's going to be very active in first going after Liz Cheney, who voted <laughs> to impeach him a second time. He's already got his allies in Congress like Matt Gates, working on that. Uh, but I, I would guess that he's going to be an active voice from the outside and he will critique party candidates as to how establishment or how America first they are. And if the Republican party thinks like Mitch McConnell that they can separate themselves from Trump because they're in a snit about how he handled it two months after the election, then they're going to find themselves in the wilderness because they cannot win without the Trump voters. Let me just say one thing. Was anybody here surprised 
about the Liz Cheney vote. I mean, she wanted to vote. She she had she had whipped the vote and and she she got 145 people that said, hey, you stay in a leadership position. I mean, maybe we're just in an echo chamber here and and they're we're wrong. We're all wrong. And and there are a lot of, you know, dyed in the wool standard run of the mill kind of GOPers out there. Well, I wasn't surprised by by that vote, but at the same time, I I don't think it really matters. Liz Cheney is in trouble, and and it's not. I don't think I think it's even just her vote for impeachment. She's a neocon. She's part of the establishment, and the establishment is in trouble. I'm loving all of this. I don't think that the GOP is going to go away. I think the GOP, as we know it, is going to go away. We're not going back to the days of the establishment. As far as you know, her not being stripped of her leadership position. I mean, that was a that was a decision made by the elites, the establishment. The real test is going to come in 2022, and it's not looking good for her. The rank and file Republican conservative voters are not fans of hers. She's pulled, she's pulling very badly in Wyoming already. You've got Matt Gates out there, and and no, and and it is not just her; it's the entire establishment. And we do have an idea of what Trump is doing. I mean, he's formed a political action committee who is dedicated to attacking the incumbents that are part of the establishment, especially those who who supported the Democrats impeachment effort. He as of this as of January of this year, he's raised over 30 million dollars and he's going to raise more. So Trump Trump is is just pulling the hammer back. He, he's he's getting ready to go, but he is going to have a say. I, I don't know if he's going to start a third party. I think he's already kind of said that he doesn't really want to do that, but he's going to use his influence to go after establishment incumbents during the primaries, which is exactly what we need. Andrew Moran, what does dost thou say? Well, I, I think that maybe they're maybe they're afraid to go after Liz Cheney because they'd be afraid to go in the wilderness with uh, uh, Dick Cheney and go hunting. So maybe maybe that's. <laughs> but you know, this could be a prime opportunity for the Whig, the Whig Party. The Whig Party could make a comeback in uh, the post-Trump era. But you know, if I were a Republican, a principled Republican, a Calvin Coolidge or Robert Taft Republican, I would have left this party a long time ago. I would have left it when George W. Bush became president. This was a guy who you know he ran up huge deficits. He went into these wars. He put everything on credit cards. He expanded the size and scope of government. He had the surveillance state. And everything that Bush started and, and everything that the Trump Republicans despise today was happened under him and was exacerbated or maintained by his predecessors. I, the only hope that GOP has is having people like Thomas Massey or Rand Paul hopefully lead the Republican Party in the future. Uh, but at the same time, I do give the GOP some credit because they're actually having they're actually firing back, you know, with this whole uh, uh, Greek uh, Congresswoman Green, you know, they're, they're starting to go after Elon Omar and trying to kick her off the committees by, you know, I guess, using as revenge against what's, ha- what's going to happen with um, uh, Representative Green. But overall, I mean, if anyone thought that Mitch McConnell was going to have a backbone and do something, you know, serious for the for the future of the Republican Party after Trump left, you know, that's just as insane as the Q shamans when they when they appeared on Capitol Hill a month ago. Well, Jeff, I know you've been pining for uh, some changes in the GOP for a long, long time. Um, what kind of changes have, have you been advocating and why? And do you think we're on the cusp of maybe getting there? Yeah, a lot of it has to do with, with, with what uh, what Andrew just said. I mean, uh, the, the neocon establishment needs to go. They're still in power to a certain extent, but they, they need to go. We need to stop being so involved in unnecessary wars. We need a GOP who will actually appeal to all Americans, and uh, that includes minorities. We, we want, I want a GOP that follows Trump's example as far as reaching out to Black and Hispanic voters. Um, we, we need a, a government that is actually conservative and not uh, and not uh, representatives who are just in office who pretend to be conservative. We want actual, we, we want a better economy. We want lower taxes. We want less regulations. We want all the stuff that the, the establishment has said that they've wanted for decades, but didn't really want. So really th- th- there isn't much new here. It's just the difference is that we want people who will actually put that into action instead of just talking about it. I would suggest that those people in the GOP, they want to go back to the days, the good old days of George W. Bush, the George Wills, the Bill Crystals, the neoconservatives, the Warhawks, all of those people. I would suggest that they look at the 2016 Republican presidential primary, where the GOP put forward every single one of their top tier candidates, Scott Walker, Jeb Bush, Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, and on and on, 17 candidates, 
And Donald Trump wiped out every single one of them. Do they really believe the parties changed so much in four years that now they say, well, let's go back to the days of McCain and Romney? I don't think so. But at the same time, I mean, when, when Trump was president, what really changed in the Republican Party when it comes to the big issues? Trump ran trillion dollar deficits. He still had troops in Afghanistan and Iraq. The Patriot Act was still there. He could have he could have pardoned Julian Assange or Edward Snow, and he chose not to. He chose a side with the Mitch McConnells and Lindsey Graham's. So, you know, I, you know, President Trump, he, he was better than a lot of his Republican predecessors. But to suggest that he was the Messiah and completely transformed the Republican Party and the United States government, you know, I, I, th I think it's absurd. It was all well, I, would, I would say suggest that he has transformed the Republican Party, Andrew, because the truth is that the Republican Party is now, hold your breath, the party of the working class. When, exactly. did, you, when did you ever think you would say that happened? I consider that to be the, the, the most significant part of the Trump era is that he did transform the Republican Party into a party of working class everyday Americans who felt basically distanced from the coastal elites who were running the Democratic Party. Exactly. I, I, that, that's a fundamental change in the Republican Party. Sarah, what were you going to say? You, you, he, did, he did change the way that uh, Republicans think. I mean, you don't bring people out of the woodwork for 20,000 people to fill up a stadium wearing red and shout MAGA and not think the man had a everlasting impact on taking the Republican party down to, to its embers. And, and, you know, I left the Republican party during George Bush and, and I re-registered to vote for that man because he was different. He, he was bringing a new energy. People wanted that success. They want a winner. And now we've got people in leadership such as McConnell and, and McCarthy, McConnell won't even take a, a phone call from Trump. I mean, what the hell is up with that? Well, he, he has I mean, to go down there and beg and then say, oh, we're on board. They're not on board. I can, I can almost guarantee they are not on board together. As, as far as Mitch McConnell is concerned, you have to understand his mindset. As far as he's concerned, Donald Trump cost him control of the Senate. His view is that he would have won at least one, if not both of those Senate races in Georgia, were it not for the behavior of President Trump. That's his view, which is why he's not going to take any calls from him anymore and he's going to distance himself. But who he's going to replace Donald Trump with as the leader of the Republican Party, who's it going to be? Him? <laughs> I don't think no. so. Who's no, it? Kevin Donald, you know, if he expects us to get on board, and, and let me tell you, I, I have been inundated with financial requests from different parties, both sides of the aisle, actually both Democrat and Republican, inundated with financial requests. Um, and, and it's desperate, it's a desperate measure. They are way underfunding. Nobody likes what they're doing. People are ticked off, people that, you know, maxed out all of their donations to the RNC to help put Trump back into office. Uh, you know, I can pick up the phone and call 10 people right now and every single one of them is going to say, I ain't giving them any money. Screw them. But maybe someone, can, maybe someone on this panel can answer this question. Uh, Jeff alluded to with the neoconservatives. If Trump was so adamant about joining the swamp, why did he add the chief swamp creatures to his administration? John Kelly, John Bolton. A lot of the establishment Republicans were, were, were key elements of the Trump administration. Why did that happen? I think it's, I can answer that because when Trump, unlike Ronald Reagan, who came marching into Washington with an army of longtime supporters, Trump came in all by himself. He had no one supporting him. The only senator who even endorsed him was Jeff Sessions, who turned out to be a disaster as attorney general. <laughs> <laughs> but but he came marching in alone and he knew in order to govern at all. He had to have some establishment figures. It took him, you know, two, three years to figure out who he could trust and who he couldn't and separating, you know, a guy like Mike Pompeo, who he could trust from the many that he hired that he found out that he couldn't trust. So I think okay. that's the answer. I don't think he wanted to hire establishment people, sure but I think he figured if he was going to okay. get anything done, he had to. I'm going to wrap this up. Jeff, final word. 
Yeah, I would say that, you know, there were things that Trump could have done, like he could have done more to, to stop the wars and, and, and yada, yada, yada. But the bottom line is that Trump did bring about a paradigm shift on the right. And, no, and even if he did everything that he could do, he was never going to be able to bring about all of the changes that we wanted. This is a starting point. So that's why I always focus more on the GOP than on Trump, because at the end of the day, it's not all about Trump. We have to focus on the Republican Party and holding them accountable. Trump can only do so much. He can do a lot, but he can't wave a magic wand. He, I think he did largely what he was supposed to do when it comes to changing how the right thinks about approaching policy and approaching politics, approaching the media and approaching the country. Now it's time to build on that. Okay, good stuff. Both Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy have Quite a bit on the line. What will they do to save the grand old party? Or is she in the process of writing her own death warrant? Our old gal pal, Maxine Waters, is in the news again, and not for inciting violence against Trump folks, but for doling out campaign dollars to her daughter. A cool 1.1 million to be exact is what many are saying. This is apparently based on Federal Election Commission data. The daughter of the California Democrat organized a slate mailing operation to push her mother's reelection. The thing is, slate mailing is uncommon, so uncommon. Maxine is the only federal candidate in 2020 to use such tactics. So how, how is it that no one is talking about this? Jeff, let's start with you. What's up with the lack of reporting on for what for all the world appears to be the misuse of campaign funds? Will the California Democrat remain untouchable in your opinion? Unfortunately, yes, she will remain untouchable. Maxine Waters has a history of corruption. She, I think she was even voted the most, uh, had the most uh, ethics violations in, in, in the House of Representatives. She, she has a long history of being corrupt. And even people in her district know that she's corrupt, but she's going to remain in place. Why? Because of what I always say, the GOP won't challenge her. They won't put up a viable challenger. The person that, that, that they put up or supported to challenge her in this past election season it was a joke. He ended up in jail for stalking a girl. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it, until the Republicans actually take this stuff seriously and start actually mounting challenges, people like Maxine Waters will stay in Congress until they decided to retire or until they die. So, I mean, it doesn't really matter what she does because she will not be held accountable. The activist media is not going to call her out. And, and, and she recently just, just accused President Trump of premeditated murder for the riots. So she can say and do whatever she wants, and she knows it. Wow, that's pretty clear. <laughs> Sarah, <laughs> your, 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 thoughts, less. <laughs> your thoughts on, on Maxine Waters? Well, Maxine is not only, you know, feathering the nest of her daughter. I mean, over the years, she has paid millions of dollars to random family members. I mean, come on. Who wouldn't want to be related to that woman, even if she is as crazy as she seems? Um, I, I, I can't believe that somebody hasn't called her on it. Um, over the years, I mean, press didn't used to be so squishy, you know, about they didn't used to be so anti middle of the road. And, you know, 20 years ago, somebody should have nailed her then. I, I, don't, I'm, I kind of agree with Jeff. I don't see her coming down unless she, you know, trips down the Capitol steps accidentally or something. And Andrew, I know this offends your, your sense of uh, you're the economic correspondent here. This, this just offends your sensibilities. Well, in a way, I look at the bright side, because if there's more corrupt politicians like Maxine Waters, hopefully, you know, more Americans will wake up to just how corrupt the U.S. government is and whether it's in the House or the Senate. But I think Tim would appreciate this. I think Maxine Waters' new campaign theme song should be Dirty Water. And for those who don't know, Dirty Water is a theme song that the Boston Red Sox play after after they win at Fenway Park. But, you know, everyone's right here. She's going to get away with it. I mean, just look look at her her, her latest endeavor. She's going to she's going to go after memers on the Reddit uh, Wall Street bets uh, game stop saga and have them testify you know that's her priority and of course as just said you know getting trump charged with premeditated murder so maxine waters you know in a way it's she her she's a great congresswoman because she provides a lot of entertainment to conservatives okay trivia question who wrote dirty water and sang it Bing. got me <laughs> The Babe Standells, Ruth. the Standells. I was going to say Babe Ruth because it was the Red Sox. Uh, but, oh, that's right. They traded him to the Yankees. I forgot about that. Sorry, Andrew. Um, <laughs> the thing is that let's tie this behavior by 
Maxine Waters to that of the Biden family to point out that this is endemic to the swamp. This is the type of behavior. This is the type of corruption that Donald Trump ran against, that anybody who wants reform in government from Andrew right on down, you know, is dying for this kind of activity to go away because it continues. People come to Washington poor. They leave rich. They never explain how it happened. We know about the Biden family. We know about Maxine Waters. It happens with Republicans, too. This is quintessential swamp behavior, the kind that the voters went out in force to vote against in 2016. And as far as 2020, your guess is as good as mine. Yeah, I wrote a couple of years ago talk, having a laundry list of all the politicians, kids who have benefited either, you know, serving in government or getting nice positions in nonprofit organizations or corporations or or uh, law offices just because of who, who, they're, who they're connected to. The Kennedy family, God, they, they've had such, you know, ex established positions and millions of dollars in the bank accounts going from uh, even before JFK, his father, uh, uh, Joseph Kennedy. Uh, so all these people, you know, if you have a great last name in Washington, you're going to set yourself up. You're going to be a wealthy person. You know, this actually kind of ties into another uh, troubling aspect of American political discourse today. I, I, even the rank and file voters won't hold people accountable if they're on their sides. We have prioritized team, a team sports mentality over actual corruption. We care more about defending our own than we do about uh, dealing with corruption. Maxine Waters could shoot somebody on Crenshaw and nothing would happen to her because everybody on the left would defend her because she's on their team. We've kind of lost that over, over the past few decades, the, the notion that it doesn't matter what political party you're a part of. If you're, if you're engaging in illicit activity, you need to be held accountable. But now we only have this principle when it's based on somebody that we don't like. And, and both sides do it, but nothing will change until we get out of that mindset to where we can take somebody, if, if you're a Democrat and you see another Democrat doing something that's blatantly wrong and call that out, that's when things will change. But as it is right now, we're so ingrained in our teams that we're not willing to do that. Well, maybe maybe the best way to do that is to put pressure, the constituent, the voter, to put pressure on the parties and say, you ain't getting a dime of our money unless you clean house. Yep. I mean, yeah, that's a good idea. Of course, the problem is that we only have two political parties. I mean, this is not a parliamentary no, no, system where we have multiple parties. So you've got ca basically catch all parties where you've got Donald Trump and Mitt Romney in the same party. And you've got Maxine Waters and Joe Manchin in the same party under the same basic umbrella, even though they believe things, you know, very differently. Uh, but the, the people... I th the people made their statement in 2016 about the type of corruption we're talking about here. But I mean, it goes the list goes on and on to the point where I, I have said that I don't believe Hunter Biden will ever the Hunter Biden story will ever be brought to light because it will be so easy for the Biden administration to go to various members of Congress in their own party, but mostly in the GOP and say, gee, it'd be a shame if I revealed the story of this contributor and what you got in return for it, because Washington is replete with stories like that. So consequently, because it is, nobody wants to point the finger at anybody else because they're afraid it'll get pointed right back at them. Well, if this, if this administration wants unity, they're going to have to get at the party level and people are going to have to just go, here's our five, you get rid of these five and we'll get rid of those five or however many, it could be the whole dang, you know, Congress. I don't know, but I think that there needs to be something from the ground up because the top down is not working. I think it was Thomas Sewell who said that if you passed a law against lying in Washington, it would be an eerie silence from coast, uh, from, uh, from district to district. <laughs> an E.F. Hutton moment, right? But I think you, you uh, mentioned earlier, uh, Sarah, that Waters' daughter isn't the only fam family member who's profited from her time uh, in all her campaigns. In 2004, the LA Times found several members of Waters' clan yeah. had received over a million dollars in the previous eight years mm -hmm. from businesses and campaigns relating to Maxine Waters. So she seems to be continuing this operation with impunity. Anyway, nice work if you can get it. Thanks, guys. That's all I have to say on the matter. And that's all we have time for today.
It didn't take long for Mr. Biden to executive order the Keystone XL pipeline out of existence. Thousands of oil and gas workers lost their jobs with the stroke of a pen. Unions are hopping mad. And we're wondering, do people understand how we heat our homes, get to work, get our kids to school? Is this ban on fossil fuels going to destroy more middle class families? That is the question. What do you say, Andrew? Do Democrats have any idea the number of petroleum products now slated to simply disappear? Well, I think they do, because if you look at insecticides, fertilizers and deodorants, they're made with oil. They're made with fossil fuels. And when you're a chief creature in the swamp, it's understandable why you want to get rid of some of these products. You know, so but in all seriousness, I, I think they don't realize the damage that they're going to they're going to inflict on the United States economy, especially in the post coronavirus recovery by targeting oil and gas the way they were doing. I mean, getting rid of the Keystone Pipeline, that's going to get rid of a, at least 11,000 jobs, according to uh, TC Energy. Uh, if also, if you want to use the argument of climate change, if you look at the emissions data, U.S. emissions are at a 30 year low. And this is uh, this is outside of the Paris Accord. The countries that are part of a Paris Accord, they've actually increased their emissions. So the climate change argument is flimsy as best. And, you know, now that the, the whole world is transitioning to natural gas, the U.S. is going to miss out on this huge billion dollar opportunity. Russia has a vast reservoir of uh, natural gas. Canada, they have a 13 billion dollar natural gas industry. Saudi Arabia is in investing in uh, natural gas, so they're going to become a huge player. The whole world is is getting is transitioning from oil to natural gas. And, you know, by by targeting this industry, the US, the U.S. is going to lose out on a huge market. Right now, the U.S. is, US is energy independent and it's able to become a net exporter in, uh, in uh, fossil fuels, natural gas and all that stuff. Uh, so by Biden doing this, you know, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna miss out on a massive job creation. And I think another thing that's important to point out, too, is that if you because uh, right now with the with the executive orders, they target uh, new permits. Right now, there's enough permits going around that's going to have enough output for another couple of years. But after that, you know, there's going to be less supply in the market when the demand when the demand recovers. So you have the cost of things are going to increase. So you have the inflationary aspect too. So the cost of living is going to go up when you start reining in oil, oil and gas, and you know when, when uh, the the energy markets uh, recover. But let's face it, Andrew, uh, with John Kerry flying around, emissions are bound to go up. Yeah, exactly. Well, I can tell you this, and for those of you who don't know, I graduated, went to school, and graduated high school in the in the four corners area and it's all oil and gas that's what makes the state of new mexico's economy and they're completely losing their minds guess where most of those jobs came from the the whacking of the jobs new mexico pennsylvania um and 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 my mailbox has filled up simply filled up with everybody i know going what the heck what can we do about this And and I don't see any way out of it. I don't. But, you know, the most underrated element of the Trump presidency, which he didn't talk about enough and others didn't, was that we actually achieved energy independence. Think about how long we sought energy independence. Think about all the politicians that promised that we'll become energy independent. Well, Donald Trump actually did it. And he didn't do it with wind power and, and, and the sun. He did it with fossil fuels and he brought the price. Consequently, the price comes down when we have energy independence and are not dependent on foreign oil and OPEC in the Middle East. And we don't have to send our kids into foreign wars for the sake of oil anymore. This is this is a metaphysical significance to the United States. So the idea that we're now going to pull back from becoming 100% 100% energy independent for the sake of what? Uh, for, fo- for non-fossil fuels, for renewable energies that will drive people's energy costs through the roof. People want cheap, affordable energy, period. You know, I think every election since I've been able to vote, it was all about we have to become energy independent. We have to become energy independent. So we finally become energy energy independent. And the very next person that comes along does stuff to stop us from becoming energy independent. I don't get it. Well, that, that's because they were just kidding when they said that. That, that was a joke. We, we didn't get the joke. <laughs> just sounded good. 
I, I mean, I mean, the globalists. I mean, the, I mean, if, if you're you're a globalist, you don't really care about us being energy independent. You want us more entangled with other nations. So it makes sense that you would roll back some of those things, even if it puts people out of work, even if it makes things more expensive for everyday Americans. This stuff isn't going to touch the elite, the globalists, so they don't care. And didn't one of Biden's advisors say that even if we got our emissions down to zero, it wouldn't really even make a difference because of what other countries are doing? Exactly. I mean, exactly. U.S. is about seventy percent of the world emissions. I'm sorry, would you, could you say that again, Andrew? Oh, the United States, they represent about 17% of the world's emissions, you know, and as I said earlier, if you look at the actual emissions data, all these countries that are part of the Paris Climate Accord, their emissions are going up. So, you know, the United States is negligible. And one other thing too, uh, I know maybe, you know, we shouldn't talk about this, but former President Barack Obama, he actually helped with the whole energy dependence thing by lifting the ban on foreign exports and allowing some offshore drilling too. So I think Obama should, you know, in all fairness, get some credit too, even though, you know, he paid lip service to the whole, you know, uh, climate change uh, glo a globalist and tree hugger movement. And now there's 195 countries in the world. What if we're the only ones who want to live by the strict standards that the left wants, the people in the environmental, well, you could call it the environmental extremist movement or the environmental activist movement. What about the other 194 countries? If we by ourselves reduce our carbon footprint and nobody else does, what difference is it going to make? And the left admitted long ago in the in the early part of this century when Al Gore was, you know, had lost the election, it kind of lost his mind with the whole uh, <laughs> hockey stick thing and global warming and everything. But they they admitted that a single remember the Kyoto Protocol they admitted that even if we were to accept it and embrace it, which we didn't, that you'd need 30 or 40 more Kyoto protocols to even make a dent in climate change because, hey, headline news, we can't affect the weather. You know, it, but it, it's also important to note, though, and, and to remember that, and I can't remember if it was Corbin Trend or Saikot Chakrabarty, uh, former AOC staffers, talking about the Green New Deal and saying, this isn't really about the environment. This is only partly about the environment. They're, they're pushing this stuff because they actually want to impose more Marxist policies. And if you look at the Green New Deal, that's exactly what it is. A lot of what was in that document had nothing to do with the environment. It's why they even try to bring racism into it and saying that environmental racism is a thing. They're, they're, they're trying to push an agenda that really doesn't have as much to do with the environment, but they're using the banner of climate change to push that agenda. So I, I think that we that we also have to focus on that as well because they're they're doing a sleight of hand on on the American public, and I think it, it's important that we keep calling that out. There was actually a, a congressional testimony from I think it was one of AOC's former no actually no AOC was questioning uh, a, a so called expert and he was saying how oh well, you know pollution is part of white privilege and it's white people's fault. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at India? Have you looked at China? It's not it's, uh, <laughs> not completely white people you know polluting the planet or you know polluting the waters. Oh, they just have tans. You know they're all one. We didn't do it. Dang it. Come on. Well, yeah. Sarah, I was talking to you the other day, and you're like, well, what do they think tractors run on? Well, geez, I didn't know tractors ran on natural gas, you know? And I wonder if how many people know the denture adhesive, candles, movie film, glasses, all the, all these you, things, you know? You, can't, the you, you cannot drive a jet airplane with a windmill. No. Or the no. sun. You can't. You, you can't fire up a combine unless you've got fuel. I mean, you can't plug it in and, and let it go. It doesn't work that way. It's too much. And they because of because these, get over it. because these renewable energies are not reliable, they have to back up all of them with fossil fuel. So yep. you, you, you can't rely strictly on wind or solar or biofuels. You you have to have a uh, you have to have fossil fuels, and that's a dirty little secret. You can't just get rid of fossil fuels because so much of society would 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 cease to function without them. But they don't want to tell you that. They want to make it seem like, oh, we can do all the same things with clean renewable okay, energy. OK, OK, we're running out of time. Final word from our economics correspondent, Andrew Moran. Well, I think another thing, too, uh, uh, 
when you look at the, the renewable energy market, it's going to make the economy less efficient. The reason why is because to create the same amount of power as a little clump of coal would with solar energy requires 89 employees. Now, the left thinks this is a great idea because it creates more jobs. At the same time, it's going to raise the prices of energy. So it's, it's not efficient right now. And I agree that green energy costs are gradually coming down, but not to the extent of how cheap it is, how cheap oil and natural gas are right now. Well, perhaps in four years, a new executive order will replace this one if we all survive that long without basketballs, denture adhesive, and scotch tape. It's Super Bowl week featuring the Kansas City Chiefs and the Brady-led Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But since the country is still somewhat under quarantine, we're going to look at the many crafty and ridiculous plays of the ongoing game in the swamp. AOC is lobbing accusations of abuse and attempted murder. Mitch McConnell is acting like a woman scorned over President Trump. And some are musing that fencing around the Capitol is simply keeping Joe Biden from, well, wandering off. So here we are, ready to bring you the Swamp Super Bowl of leftist antics. Tim, who is your loony player of the week and why? I'm not going to pick a single person. I'm going to pick every person that continues to call for the removal of Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz from the Senate. It isn't enough to go after President Trump and try to impeach a president who's no longer president. Understanding, of course, that the point of impeachment is to remove someone from office, not to punish them. So therefore, there's no basis for impeaching a former president. But that's not enough for the left. They need to go further and call for the removal of Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz for daring to ask for an audit of the election on the famous day of January 6th. And so, you know, the fact of whether the election deserved to be challenged or not is separate from the issue of whether a senator can be censured or removed from the Senate for doing the most fundamental chore of a senator or fundamental privilege, which is voicing an opinion. Okay, Sarah. Okay, well, just this week, and and you gotta love this, the spokeswoman for the White House and for President Joe Biden, who can't string three words together, it seems, to make a coherent sentence, um, she apparently can't either. She's the most uninformed, unprepared press secretary I've ever seen. And geez, if she didn't tweet out the dumbest thing a Democrat could tweet, and that's calling Lindsey Graham gay. You don't use the homophobic slur in your everyday business practices. I'm sorry. Lady G is not the way you handle things. You little red haired weirdo. She needs to step down. (laughs) He's going to have to circle back with you on that, though. Yes. (laughs) All right. Sarah said a love affair with Miss Pisaki or however you say it. Uh, Jeff, go. I am going to have to go with media activist Brian Stelter, Uh. who recently supported censorship and tried to call for diminishing Fox News and other conservative leaning outlets and people on social media because they say things that hurt his feelings. So he, but I will give him, I will give him points. He did channel his inner Al Sharpton when he said, you know, uh, freedom of speech is not the same as freedom of reach. I I, I had to give him some applause for that. I think he actually consulted with Sharpton on that rhyming scheme because that is very Sharpton-esque. But the notion that that, that you are a propo- promoting free speech, but just saying you just wanna diminish somebody's reach because you don't like it, is trying to diminish free speech. And of course, he's not gonna acknowledge the fact that his own outlet has lied on numerous occasions. Blatantly, he himself has lied, but their lies are okay. They, they, they're okay with lying as long as, as long as they're doing it. So yeah, he, he, he is my, he is my uh, star player here. Just Jeff, you need to remember one thing along the line of rhymes. If the glove don't fit, you must acquit. Yes, exactly. All right, Andrew, what do you got for us? All right, I'm gonna have to go with CNN's, again, uh, CNN's Chris Saliza. Uh, He was talking about the whole GameStop saga and the hedge funds. And for some odd reason, he decided to tie in President Donald Trump and blaming him for what happened by talking about his message of the anti-establishment, you know, all, all everyone on Wall Street bets who, 
you know, ag- agreed with Trump and they started going after the hedge funds and the whole Wall Street saga. So CNN's Chris Saleza is my top pick. But I have to go for a second pick. I'm going to go with Jimmy Kimmel because he says that the Wall Street bets people who pumped up uh, GameStop are Russian agents or Russian disruptors. Excuse me. Oh, oh that, 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 that's really good. <laughs> Isn't right, it obvious? I thought that was obvious. I thought that was an established fact. It isn't? No, and Mother right. Russia, GameStop disrupts you. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So this little ditty was found in our headlines written by Liberty Nation, Joe Schaefer. And if you don't get our daily briefing and don't get our headlines, you're really missing something. They're fantastic. Mm-hmm. But I'm quoting mm-hmm. Joe here. Uh, Two progressive state representatives in New Mexico are sponsors of a bill that would end mandatory minimum prison sentences for offenders convicted of sexual assault against children. This is according to a local New Mexico newspaper, a fiscal impact report on the proposed legislation clearly states that, quote, it eliminates the mandatory minimum term of imprisonment of three years for second degree felony criminal sexual conduct of a minor. The New Mexico Republican Party is crazy calling it despicable. But this was tucked away in legislation pertaining to fish and wildlife infractions. Uh, Oddly, both of these legislators, representatives Karen Bash and Andrea Romero, are women. Going easy on people who prey on kids. For shame. Well, guys, who should win our Super Bowl Player of the Week? Let's vote. We've got... Jen Psaki, we've got uh, Jimmy Kimmel, we've got uh, who do you got, Jeff? Uh, I, I would I, I would actually go for for the legislators that you just named. I mean, the idea that we that we <laughs> have mandatory minimums for people who abuse children that that's disgusting. Yeah, two women and and you're the father of two girls. I, I thought that might speak to you. Anyone else? Yeah. I'm, going with, I'm, I'm going I, with that one too. Me too. New Mexico needs to be pimp slapped for the crap they keep spewing. All right. Are uh, you on board? Make it unanimous. Are you still going for uh, uh, your guy, Jimmy Kimmel? I'll agree, but I will say that Jimmy Kimmel, his statement is the personification of the left over the last four years when everything is Russia, even when it comes to a stock. Fair enough. But I win. Yay. Well, guys and gal. Thanks so much, and that'll do it for the Hall of Shame and the Super Bowl of leftist loony antics. That's it for our Conservative 5 panel today. Check out our other C5 shows and segments on your favorite video platform, YouTube, Vimeo, Rumble, we're on them all. As well, Liberty Nation has its own Roku channel where you can see all our TV productions. Thanks so much for tuning in. And remember to surf on over to LibertyNation.com. Sign up for our new member zone, just $17.76 for the year. And remember, liberty all the time and everywhere.